Flun Ukba Orbis Tertius. 1. I owe the discovery of Ukba to the conjunction of a mirror and an encyclopedia. The mirror troubled the far end of a hallway in a large country house in Calagoaona in Ramos Maya. The encyclopedia is misleadingly titled The Anglo-American Cyclopedia, New York 1917, and is a literal, although also laggardly, reprint of the 1902 Encyclopedia Britannica. The event took place about five years ago. Bioy Cesares had come to a dinner at my house that evening. We had lost all track of time in a vast debate over the way one might go about composing a first-person novel whose narrator would omit or distort things and engage in all sorts of contradictions, so that a few of the book's readers, a very few, might divine the horrifying or banal truth. Down at that far end of the hallway, the mirror hovered, shadowing us. We discovered, very late at night, such a discovery is inevitable, that there is something monstrous about mirrors. That was when Bioy remembered a saying by one of the heresiarchs of Ukbar. Mirrors and copulation are abominable, for they multiply the number of mankind. I asked him where he'd come across that memorable epigram. And he told me it was recorded in the Anglo-American Cyclopedia, in its article on Ukbar. The big old house, we had taken it furnished, possessed a copy of that work. On the last pages of volume 46, we found an article on Uppsala. On the first of volume 47, Ural Altaic Languages. Not a word on Ukbar. Bioy. Somewhat bewildered, consulted the volumes of the index. He tried every possible spelling. Ukba, 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 Ukbe, all in vain. Before he left, he told me it was a region in Iraq or Asia Minor. I confess I nodded a bit uncomfortably. I surmised that that undocumented country and its anonymous heresiarch were a fiction that Bioy had invented on the spur of the moment out of modesty in order to justify a fine-sounding epigram. A sterile search through one of the atlases in Justus Perthus reinforced my doubt. The next day, Bioy called me from Buenos Aires. He told me he had the article on Ukba right in front of him, in volume 46. The heresiarch's name wasn't given, but the entry did report his doctrine, formulated in words almost identical to those Bioy had quoted, though, from a literary point of view, perhaps inferior. Bioy had remembered its being, quote, copulation and mirrors are abominable, end quote, while the text of the encyclopedia ran, for one of those Gnostics, the visible universe was an illusion, or more precisely, a sophism. Mirrors and fatherhood are hateful because they multiply and proclaim it. Well, I told Bioy quite truthfully that I'd like to see that article, a few days later, he brought it to me, which surprised me, because the scrupulous cartographic indices of Ritter's Erdkunde evinced complete and total ignorance of the existence of the name Ukba. The volume Bioy brought was indeed volume 46 of the Anglo-American Cyclopedia. On both the false cover and spine, the alphabetical key of the volume's contents, Tor to Oops was the same as ours, but instead of 917 pages, Bioy's volume had 921. Those four additional pages held the article on Ukbar, an article not contemplated, as the reader will have noted, by the alphabetical key. We later compared the two volumes and found that there was no further difference between them. Both as I believe I have said, are reprints of the 10th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Bioy had purchased his copy at one of his many sales. We read the article with some care. The passage that Bioy had recalled was perhaps the only one that might raise a reader's eyebrow. The rest seemed quite plausible, very much in keeping with the general tone of the work, even, naturally, somewhat boring. 
Rereading it, however, we discovered that the rigorous writing was underlain by a basic vagueness. Of the 14 names that figured in the section on geography, we recognised only three. Khorasan, Armenia, Erzurum. We interpolated into the text ambiguously. Of the historical names, we recognised only one, the imposter wizard Schmerdis, and he was invoked, really, as a metaphor. The article seemed to define the borders of Ukbar, but its nebulous points of reference were rivers and craters and mountainous chains of the region itself. We read, for example, that the Axa Delta and the lowlands of Sai Khaldun mark the southern boundary, and that wild horses breed in the islands of the delta. That was at the top of page 918. In the section on Ukbar's history, page 920, we learn that religious persecutions in the 13th century had forced the Orthodox to seek refuge on the same islands, where the obelisks are still standing and their stone mirrors are occasionally unearthed. The section titled Language and Literature was brief. One memorable feature, the article said that the literature of Ukbar was a literature of fantasy, and that its epics and legends never referred to reality, but rather to the two imaginary realms of Mle Khnans and Tlun. The bibliography listed four volumes we have yet to find, though the third, Silas Haslam's History of the Land called Ukbar, 1874, does figure in the catalogues published by Bernard Quaritch, bookseller. Footnote. Haslam was also the author of A General History of Labyrinths. The first, Lesbada und Leisenswerther Bemerkungen über das Land Ukbar in Kleinasien, published in 1641, is the work of one Johannes Valentinus Andrea. That fact is significant. Two or three years afterwards, I came upon that name in the unexpected pages of De Quincey, writings, volume 13, where I learned that it belonged to a German theologian who in the early 17th century described an imaginary community, the Rosy Cross, which other men later found it in imitation of his fore description. That night, Bioy and I paid a visit to the National Library, where we poured in vain through atlases, catalogues, the yearly indices published by geographical societies, the memoirs of travellers and historians. No one had ever been in Ukbar. Nor did the general index in Bioy's copy of the encyclopedia contain that name. The next day, Carlos Mastronardi, whom I had told about all this, spotted the black and gold spines of the Anglo-American Cyclopedia in a bookshop at the corner of Corrientes and Talcahuano. He went in and consulted volume 46. Naturally, he found not the slightest mention of Ukbar. Part 2 some limited and waning memory of Herbert Asher, an engineer for the Southern Railway Line, still lingers in the hotel of Atrogwe. Among the effusive honeysuckle vines and the illusory depths of the mirrors. In life, Asher was afflicted with unreality, as so many Englishmen are. In death, he is not even the ghost he was in life. He was tall and phlegmatic and his weary, rectangular beard had once been red. I understood that he was a widower, and without issue. I am judging from some photographs he showed us. Every few years he would go back to England to make his visit to a sundial and a stand of oak trees. My father had forged one of those close English friendships with him. The first adjective is perhaps excessive. They begin by excluding confidences, and soon eliminate conversation. They would exchange books and newspapers. They would wage taciturn battle at chess. I recall Asher on the hotel veranda holding a book of mathematics, looking up sometimes at the irrevocable colours of the sky. One evening we spoke about the duodecimal number system, in which 12 is written 1, 0. Asher said that by coincidence he was just then transposing some duodecimal table or other to sexagesimal, in which 60 is written 1, 0. 
He'd added that he'd been in commission to perform the task by a Norwegian man in Rio Grande do Sul. Asher and I had known each other for eight years, and he had never mentioned to stay in Brazil. We spoke of the bucolic rural life, of capangas, of the Brazilian etymology of the word gaucho, which some older folk in Uruguay still pronounce as gaucho. And nothing more was said, God forgive me, of duodecimals. In September of 1937, my family and I were no longer at the hotel, Herbert Asher died of a ruptured aneurysm. A few days before his death, he had received a sealed, certified package from Brazil, containing a book printed in octavo major. Asher left it in the bar, where, months later, I found it. I began to leaf through it, and suddenly I experienced a slight, astonished sense of dizziness that I shall not describe, since this is the story not of my emotions, but of Ukbar and Tlun and Orbis Tertius. On one particular Islamic night, which is called the Night of Nights, the secret portals of the heavens open wide, and the water in the water jars is sweeter than on other nights. If those gates had opened as I sat there, I would not have felt what I was feeling that evening. The book was written in English, and it consisted of 1,001 pages. On the leather-bound volume's yellow spine, I read these curious words, which were repeated on the false cover. A First Encyclopedia of Tlun, Volume 11, Claire to Younger. There was no date or place of publication. On the first page, and again on the onion skin page that covered one of the colour illustrations, there was stamped a blue oval with this inscription, Orbis Tertius. Two years earlier, I had discovered in one of the volumes of a certain pirated encyclopedia the brief description of a false country. Now, fate had set something before me, much more precious and painstaking. I now held in my hands a vast and systematic fragment of the entire history of an unknown planet, with its architectures and its playing cards, the horror of its mythologies and murmur of its tongues, its emperors and its seas, its minerals and its birds and fishes, its algebra and its fire, its theological and metaphysical controversies, all joined, articulated, coherent, and with no visible doctrinal purpose or hint of parody. In the quote-unquote volume 11, of which I speak, there are allusions to later and earlier volumes. Nesta Ibarra, in a now classic article in the NRF, denied that such companion volumes existed. Ezequiel Martinez Estrada and Drew La Rochelle have rebutted that doubt perhaps victoriously. The fact is, the most diligent searches have so far proven futile. In vain we have ransacked the libraries of the two Americas and Europe. Alfonso Reyes, weary of those, quote, subordinate drudgeries of a detective nature, end quote, has proposed that between us we undertake to reconstruct the many massive volumes that are missing, ex ungue leonum. He figures, half seriously, half in jest, that a generation of Tlunists would suffice. That bold estimate takes us back to the initial problem. Who, singular or plural, invented Tlun? The plural is, I suppose, inevitable, since the hypothesis of a single inventor, some infinite Leibniz, working in obscurity and self-effacement, has been unanimously discarded. It is conjectured that this brave new world is the work of a secret society of astronomers, biologists, engineers, metaphysicians, poets, chemists, algebraists, moralists, painters, geometers, guided and directed by some shadowy man of genius. There are many men adept in those diverse disciplines, but few capable of imagination, fewer still capable of subordinating imagination to a rigorous and systematic plan. The plan is so vast that the contribution of each writer is infinitesimal. At first it was thought that Tlun was a mere chaos, an irresponsible act of imaginative license. Today we know that it is a cosmos, that the innermost laws that govern it have been formulated, however provisionally so. Let it suffice to remind the reader that the apparent contradictions of volume 11 are the foundation stone of the proof that the other volumes do in fact exist. 
the order that has been observed in it is just that lucid, just that fitting. Popular magazines have trumpeted, with pardonable excess, the zoology and topography of Tlun. In my view, its transparent tigers and towers of blood do not perhaps merit the constant attention of all mankind, but I might be so bold as to beg a few moments to outline its conception of the universe. Hume declared for all time that while Barclay's arguments admit not the slightest refutation, they inspire not the slightest conviction. That pronouncement is entirely true with respect to the earth, entirely false with respect to Tlun. The nations of that planet are congenitally idealistic. Their language, and those things derived from their language, religion, literature, metaphysics, presuppose idealism. For the people of Tlun, the world is not an amalgam of objects in space. It is a heterogeneous series of independent acts. The world is successive. Temporal, but not spatial. There are no nouns in the conjectural Ursprache of Tlun, from which its quote-unquote present day languages and dialects derive. There are impersonal verbs, modified by monosyllabic suffixes or prefixes, functioning as adverbs. For example, there is no noun that corresponds to our word moon, but there is a verb which in English would be to moonate, or to in moon. The moon rose above the river is hlua u fang aksaksaksas mlu, or as zul solar succinctly translate. Upward, behind the on streaming, it mooned. That principle applies to the languages of the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, about whose Ursprache volume 11 contains very little information, the primary unit is not the verb, but the monosyllabic adjective. Nouns are formed by stringing together adjectives. One does not say, quote-unquote, moon. One says, aerial bright above dark round. Or, soft amberish celestial. Or, any other string. In this case, the complex of adjectives corresponds to a real object, but that is purely fortuitous. The literature of the Northern Hemisphere, as in Mainong's subsisting world, is filled with ideal objects, called forth and dissolved in an instant, as the poetry requires. Sometimes mere simultaneity creates them. There are things composed of two terms, one visual and the other auditory, the colour of the rising sun and the distant core of a bird. There are things composed of many, the sun and water against the swimmer's breast, the vague shimmering pink one sees when one's eyes are closed, the sensation of being swept along by a river and also by Morpheus. These objects of the second degree may be combined with others. The process, using certain abbreviations, is virtually infinite. There are famous poems composed of a single enormous word. The word is a quote-unquote poetic object created by the poet. The fact that no one believes in the reality expressed by these nouns means paradoxically that there is no limit to their number. The languages of Tlun's northern hemisphere possess all the nouns of the Indo-European languages, and many, many more. It is no exaggeration to say that the classical culture of Tlun is composed of a single discipline, psychology, to which all others are subordinate. I have said that the people of that planet conceive the universe as a series of mental processes that occur not in space, but rather successively in time. Spinoza endows his inexhaustible deity with the attributes of spatial extension of end of thought. No one in Tlun would understand the juxtaposition of the first, which is typical only of certain states, and the second, which is a perfect synonym for the cosmos. Or to put it another way, space is not conceived as having duration in time. The perception of a cloud of smoke on the horizon, and then the countryside on fire, and then the half-extinguished cigarette that produced the scorched earth is considered an example of the association of ideas. This thoroughgoing monism, or idealism, renders science null. To explain, or pass judgment on, an event is to link it to another. On Tlun, that joining together is a posterior state of the subject, and can neither affect nor illuminate the prior state. 
every mental state is irreducible. The simple act of giving it a name, i.e. of classifying it, introduces a distortion, a slant or bias. One might well deduce, therefore, that on Sloan there are no sciences, or even any systems of thought. The paradoxical truth is that systems of thought do exist, almost countless numbers of them. Philosophies are much like the nouns of the Northern Hemisphere. The fact that every philosophy is by definition a dialectical game, a philosophy des aus ob, has allowed them to proliferate. There are systems upon systems that are incredible, but possessed of a pleasing architecture, or a certain agreeable sensationalism. The metaphysicians of Tlun seek not truth, or even plausibility. They seek to amaze, astound. In their view, metaphysics is a branch of the literature of fantasy. They know that a system is naught but the subordination of all the aspects of the universe to one of those aspects, any one of them. Even the phrase, all the aspects should be avoided because it implies the impossible addition of the present instant and all those instants that went before. Nor is the plural, those instants that went before, legitimate, for it implies another impossible operation. One of the schools of philosophy on Tlun goes so far as to deny the existence of time. It argues that the present is undefined and indefinite. The future has no reality except as present hope and the past has no reality except as present recollection. Footnote. Russell, in The Analysis of Mind, 1921, page 159, posits that the world was created only moments ago, filled with human beings who quote-unquote remember an illusory past. Another school posits that all time has already passed, so that our life is but the crepuscular memory or crepuscular reflection, doubtlessly distorted and mutilated of an irrecoverable process. Yet another claims that the history of the universe, and in it our lives and every faintest detail of our lives, is the handwriting of a subordinate god trying to communicate with a demon. Another, that the universe might be compared to those cryptograms in which not all the symbols count, and only what happens every 300 nights is actually real. Another, that while we sleep here, we are awake somewhere else, so that every man is in fact two men. Of all the doctrines of Tlun, none has caused more uproar than materialism. Some thinkers have formulated this philosophy, generally with less clarity than zeal, as though putting forth a paradox. In order to make this inconceivable thesis more easily understood, an 11th century heresiarch, footnote, a century, in keeping with the duodecimal system in use on Tlun, is a period of 144 years. An 11th century heresiarch conceived the sophism of the nine copper coins, a paradox as scandalously famous on Tlun as the Eleatic Aporiae to ourselves. There are many versions of that quote-unquote specious argument, with varying numbers of coins and discoveries. The following is the most common. On Tuesday, X is walking along a deserted road and loses nine copper coins. On Thursday, Y finds four coins in the road, their luster somewhat dimmed by Wednesday's rain. On Friday, Z discovers three coins in the road. Friday morning, X finds two coins on the veranda of his house. From the story the heresiarch wished to deduce the reality, i.e. the continuity in time, of those nine recovered coins. Quote, It is absurd, he said, to imagine that four of the coins did not exist from Tuesday to Thursday, three from Tuesday to Friday afternoon, two from Tuesday to Friday morning. It is logical to think that they in fact did exist, albeit in some secret way that we are forbidden to understand, at every moment of those three periods of time. End quote. The language of Tlun resisted formulating this paradox. Most people did not understand it. The common sense school at first simply denied the anecdote's veracity. They claimed it was a verbal fallacy based on the reckless employment of two neologisms, words unauthorized by standard usage and foreign to all rigorous thought. 
the two verbs find and lose, which, since they presuppose the identity of the nine first coins and the nine latter ones, entail a petitio principii. These critics remained their, reminded their listeners that all nouns, man, coin, Thursday, Wednesday, rain, have only metaphoric value. They denounced the misleading detail that the coin's lustre was somewhat dimmed by Wednesday's rain, as presupposing what it attempted to prove, the continuing existence of the four coins from Tuesday to Thursday. They explained that equality is one thing, and identity another, and they formulated a short reductio ad absurdum. The hypothetical case of nine men who, on nine successive nights, experience a sharp pain. Would it not be absurd, they asked, to pretend that the men had suffered one and the same pain? Footnote. Today, one of Tlon's religions contends, platonically, that a certain pain, a certain greenish-yellow colour, a certain temperature, and a certain sound are all the same single reality. All men in the dizzying instant of copulation are the same man. All men who speak a line of Shakespeare are William Shakespeare. They claimed that the heresiarch was motivated by the blasphemous desire to attribute the divine category being to a handful of mere coins, and that he sometimes denied plurality and sometimes did not. They argued, if equality entailed identity, one would have to admit that the nine coins were a single coin. Incredibly, those refutations did not put an end to the matter. A hundred years after the problem had first been posed, a thinker no less brilliant than the heresiarch, but of the orthodox tradition, formulated a most daring hypothesis. His happy conjecture was that there is but a single subject, that indivisible subject is every being in the universe, and the beings of the universe are the organs and masks of the deity. X is Y, and is also Z. Z discovers three coins then because he remembers that X lost them. X finds two coins on the veranda of his house because he remembers the others that have been found. Volume 11 suggests that this idealistic pantheism triumphed over all the other schools of thought for three primary reasons. First, because it repudiated solipsism. Second, because it left intact the psychological foundation of the sciences. And third, because it preserved the possibility of religion. Schopenhauer, passionate yet lucid Schopenhauer, formulates a very similar doctrine in the first volume of his Parega und Paralipomena. Schlund's geometry is made up of two rather distinct disciplines, visual geometry and tactile geometry. Tactile geometry corresponds to our own and is subordinate to the visual. Visual geometry is based on the surface, not the point. It has no parallel lines, and it claims that as one's body moves through space, it modifies the shapes that surround it. The basis of Tlun's arithmetic is the notion of indefinite numbers. It stresses the importance of the concepts greater than and less than, which our own mathematicians represent with the symbols right angle bracket and left angle bracket. The people of Tlun are taught that the act of counting modifies the amount counted, turning indefinites into definites. The fact that several persons counting the same quantity come to the same result is for the psychologists of Tlun an example of the association of ideas, or of memorization. We must always remember that on Tlun, the subject of knowledge is one and eternal. Within the sphere of literature, too, the idea of the single subject is all-powerful. Books are rarely signed, nor does the concept of plagiarism exist. It has been decided that all books are the work of a single author who is timeless and anonymous. Literary criticism often invents authors. It will take two dissimilar works, the Tao Te Ching and the 1001 Nights, for instance, attribute them to a single author, and then, in all good conscience, determine the psychology of that most interesting homme de lettres. Their books are also different from our own. Their fiction has but a single plot, with every imaginable permutation. Their works of a philosophical nature invariably contain both the thesis and the antithesis, the rigorous pro and contra of every argument. A book that does not contain its counterbook is considered incomplete. 
Century upon century of idealism could hardly have failed to influence reality. In the most ancient regions of Tlon, one may, not infrequently, observe the duplication of lost objects. Two persons are looking for a pencil. The first person finds it, but says nothing. The second person finds a second pencil, no less real, but more in keeping with his expectations. These secondary objects are called hūnia, and they are, though awkwardly so, slightly longer. Until recently, hūnia were the coincidental offspring of distraction and forgetfulness. It is hard to believe that they have been systematically produced for only about a hundred years, but that is what volume 11 tells us. The first attempts were unsuccessful, but the modus operandi is worth recalling. The warden of one of the state prisons informed his prisoners that there were certain tombs in the ancient bed of a nearby river, and he promised that anyone who brought in an important find would be set free. Four months before the excavation, the inmates were shown photographs of what they were going to discover. The first attempt to prove that hope and greed can be inhibiting. After a week's work with pick and shovel, the only hun unearthed was a rusty wheel, dated some time later than the date of the experiment. The experiment was kept secret, but was repeated afterwards at four high schools. In three of them, the failure was virtually complete. In the fourth, where the principal happened to die during the early excavations, the students unearthed, or produced, a gold mask, an archaic sword, two or three clay amphorae, and the verdigreed and mutilated torso of a king with an inscription on the chest that has yet to be deciphered. Thus it was discovered that no witnesses who were aware of the experimental nature of the search could be allowed near the site. Group research projects produce conflicting finds. Now individual, virtually spur-of-the-moment projects are preferred. The systematic production of Hronia, says Volume 11, has been of invaluable aid to archaeologists, making it possible not only to interrogate, but even to modify the past, which is now no less plastic, no less malleable than the future. A curious bit of information. Hronia, of the second and third remove, Hronia derived from other Hron, and Hronia derived from the Hron of a Hron, exaggerate the aberrations of the first. Those of the fifth remove are almost identical. Those of the ninth can be confused with those of the second, and those of the eleventh remove exhibit a purity of line that even the originals do not exhibit. The process is periodic. The chronia of the twelfth remove begin to degenerate. Sometimes stranger and purer than any chron is the ur, the thing produced by suggestion, the object brought forth by hope. The magnificent gold mask I mentioned is a distinguished example. Things duplicate themselves on Tlun. They tend to grow vague or sketchy, and to lose detail when they begin to be forgotten. The classic example is the doorway that continued to exist as long as a certain beggar frequented it, but which was lost to sight when he died. Sometimes a few birds, a horse, have saved the ruins of an amphitheatre. Salto Oriental, 1940 Postscript, 1947 I reproduce the article above exactly as it appeared in the Anthology of Fantastic Literature in 1940, the only changes being editorial cuts of one or another metaphor and a tongue-in-cheek sort of summary that would now be considered flippant. So many things have happened since 1940. Allow me to recall some of them. In March of 1941, a handwritten letter from Gunnar Erfjord was discovered in a book by Hinton that had belonged to Herbert Asher. The envelope was postmarked Uro Preto. The mystery of Tlun was fully elucidated by the letter. It confirmed Martinez Estrada's hypothesis. The splendid story had begun sometime in the early 17th century, one night in Lucerne, or London. A secret benevolent society, which numbered among its members Dalgano and later George Barclay, was born. Its mission to invent a country. In its vague initial program, there figured hermetic studies, philanthropy, and the Kabbalah. The curious book by Valentinus Andrea dates from that early period. 
After several years of confabulations and premature collaborative drafts, the members of the society realised that one generation would not suffice for creating and giving full expression to a country. They decided that each of the masters that belonged to the society would select a disciple to carry on their work. That hereditary arrangement was followed. After an interim of 200 years, the persecuted fraternity turned up again in the New World. In 1824, in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the members had a conversation with the reclusive millionaire Ezra Buckley. Buckley somewhat contemptuously let the man talk, and then laughed at the modesty of the project. He told the man that in America it was nonsense to invent a country. What they ought to do was invent a planet. To that giant of an idea he added another, the brainchild of his nihilism. Footnote, Buckley was a freethinker, a fatalist, and a defender of slavery. The enormous enterprise must be kept secret. At that time, the twenty volumes of the Encyclopaedia Britannica were all the rage. Buckley suggested a systematic encyclopaedia of the illusory planet. He would bequeath to them his gold-veined mountains, his navigable rivers, his prairies thundering with bulls and buffalo, his negroes, his brothels and his dollars, he said, under one condition. The work shall make no pact with the impostor Jesus Christ. Buckley did not believe in God. Yet he wanted to prove to the non-existent God that mortals could conceive and shape a world. Buckley was poisoned in Baton Rouge in 1828. In 1914, the Society sent its members, now numbering 300, the final volume of the First Encyclopedia of Tlun. It was published secretly. The 40 volumes that make up the work, the grandest work of letters ever undertaken by humankind, were to be the basis for another, yet more painstaking work to be written this time not in English, but in one of the languages of Tlun. That survey of an illusory world was tentatively titled Orbis Tertius, and one of its modest demiurges was Herbert Asher. Whether as agent or colleague of Gunnar Erfjord, I cannot say. His receipt of a copy of Volume 11 seems to favour the second possibility. But what about the others? In 1942, the plot thickened. I recall with singular clarity one of the first events that occurred, something of whose premonitory nature I believe I sensed even there. It took place in an apartment on La Prida, across the street from a high, bright balcony that faced the setting sun. Princess Falchigny Lusinger had received from Poitiers a crate containing her silver table service. From the vast innards of a packing case emblazoned with international custom stamps, she removed, one by one, the fine, unmoving things. Plate from Utrecht and Paris, chased with hard heraldic fauna. A samovar. Among the pieces, throbbing softly but perceptibly, like a sleeping bird, there throbbed mysteriously a compass. The princess did not recognise it. Its blue needle yearned towards magnetic north. Its metal casing was concave. The letters on its dial belonged to one of the alphabets of Tlun. That was the first intrusion of the fantastic world of Tlun into the real world. An unsettling coincidence made me a witness to a second intrusion as well. This event took place some months later in a sort of country general store and bar owned by a Brazilian man in the Cuchilla Negra. Amorim and I were returning from Santana. There was a frechet on the Takua Rembo. As there was no way to cross, we were forced to try, to try to endure, that is, the rudimentary hospitality at hand. The storekeeper set up some creaking cots for us in a large storeroom, clumsy with barrels and stacks of leather. We lay down, but we were kept awake until almost dawn by the drunkenness of an unseen neighbour who swung between indecipherable streams of abuse and loudly sung snatches of milongas, or snatches of the same milonga, actually. As one can imagine, we attributed the man's insistent carrying on to the storekeeper's fiery rot gut. By shortly after daybreak, the man was dead in the hallway. The hoarseness of his voice had misled us. He was a young man. In his delirium, several coins had slipped from his wide gaucho belt, as had a gleaming metal cone about a die's width in diameter. A little boy tried to pick the cone-shaped object up, but in vain. 
A full-grown man could hardly do it. I held it for a few minutes in the palm of my hand. I recall that its weight was unbearable, and that even after someone took it from me, the sensation of terrible heaviness endured. I also recall the neat circle it engraved in my flesh, the evidence of a very small but extremely heavy object left an unpleasant aftertaste of fear and revulsion. A paisano suggested that we throw it in a swollen river. Amarim purchased it for a few pesos. No one knew anything about the dead man except that, quote, he came from the border, end quote. Those small, incredibly heavy cones, made of a metal not of this world, are an image of the deity in certain Tlunian religions. Well, here I end the personal portion of my narration. The rest lies in every reader's memory, if not his hope or fear. Let it suffice to recall or mention the subsequent events with a simple brevity of words which the general public's concave memory will enrich or expand. In 1944, an investigator from the Nashville American unearthed the 40 volumes of the first encyclopedia of Tlun in a Memphis library. To this day, there is some disagreement as to whether that discovery was accidental or consented to and guided by the directors of the still nebulous Orbis Tertius. The second supposition is entirely plausible. Some of the unbelievable features of Volume 11, the multiplication of Hrunia, for example, have been eliminated or muted in the Memphis copy. It seems reasonable to suppose that the cuts obey the intent to set forth a world that is not too incompatible with the real world. The spread of Tlunian objects through various countries would complement that plan. Footnote, there is still, of course, the problem of the material from which some objects are made. At any rate, the international press made a great hue and cry about this quote-unquote find. Handbooks, anthologies, surveys, quote-unquote literal translations, authorised and pirated reprints of mankind's greatest masterpiece filled the world, and still do. Almost immediately, reality caved in at more than one point. The truth is... It wanted to cave in. Ten years ago, any symmetry, any system with an appearance of order, dialectical materialism, anti-Semitism, Nazism, could spellbind and hypnotise mankind. How could the world not fall under the sway of Tlun? How could it not yield to the vast and minutely detailed evidence of an ordered planet? It would be futile to reply that reality is also orderly. Perhaps it is, but orderly in accordance with divine laws read, quote-unquote, inhuman laws, that we can never quite manage to penetrate. Tlun may well be a labyrinth, but it is a labyrinth forged by men, a labyrinth destined to be deciphered by men. Contact with Tlun, the habit of Tlun, has disintegrated this world. Spellbound by Tlun's rigour, humanity has forgotten and continues to forget. That is the rigour of chess masters, not of angels. Already, Tzlun's conjectural, quote-unquote, primitive language has filtered into our schools. Already, the teaching of Tzlun's harmonious history, filled with moving episodes, has obliterated the history that governed my own childhood. Already, a fictitious past has supplanted in men's memories that other past, of which we now know nothing certain, not even that it is false. Numismatics, pharmacology and archaeology have all been reformed. I understand that biology and mathematics are also awaiting their next avatar. The scattered dynasty of recluses has changed the face of the earth, and their work continues. If my projections are correct, a hundred years from now someone will discover the hundred volumes of the second encyclopedia of Tlun. At that, French and English and mere Spanish will disappear from the earth. The world will be Tlun. That makes very little difference to me, though my quiet days in this hotel in Adragoy, I go on revising, though I never intend to publish an indecisive translation, in the style of Quevedo of Sir Thomas Brown's Erna Burial. <laughs>